God, as we go into your word, just help us. Because God, there's just so much in your word. And God, we need your direction and your leadership as we minister in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us put the scripture on. I understand I'm in John chapter 12. And I'm somewhere down there. I think it's verse 20 I'm at. But I want you to go back up. A little oh, to the to the uh, march, the march with the palms, etc. And guess what? We gave some homework, didn't we? Did we give homework? Yes, Pastor. Yes, yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Roy, you were in charge of making sure you record the homework. Yeah. <laughs> what was the homework? So the homework. So, Go ahead. Sorry. so the homework was uh, to describe Spinard and Nard and to look at the difference in between both. Right. To, to, to talk about Nard. Oh, it's and, Nard. Uh, yes. So oh, anybody did the homework? Yes. Who said yes? Jalen. Yeah, go ahead, Mrs. Stewart. You just tell us about Nard, please. And if you have a camera right, open, so, please. So Spike Nard. What up, your camera? It had a strong, distinctive aroma, similar to an essential oil. And it would cling to the skin and the hair and continue to give off a very strong perfume. Um, it's from the roots. It's made from the roots of, a, of an Indian plant called Nardo Sachis Jatamansi. And it grows in the Himalaya mountains. Um, and it was considered to be very, very valuable. It is compared to, um, okay, so spike nard would have symbolized the best in that ancient culture, equivalent to Tiffany diamonds of today or the wow. gold standard of today. So it was a really up there kind of um, chemical to have. It had a very unique fragrance. It's mentioned in <clears throat> Song of Solomon. Yes. Um, in reference to the strength and the, the, um, the lastingness of their passion between um, Solomon and his bride. Um, and again, in the story of Mary of Bethany, when she broke her alabaster jar, yes. it was considered to be extremely uh, expensive as well. So, so, so the, the, the mere fact that she poured this thing on Jesus was a significant expenditure. This was nothing cheap that she um, that she poured on him. Um, it says that. Okay, so it says that it was. It has been speculated that this jar may have been Mary's dowry or her inheritance. Um, in other words, this jar of spikenard may have been all that she had of value and she poured it out on him. That's a speculation. Um, I'm looking for the part where another one I had read was saying that um, the cost for the spikenard was about 300, whatever whatever the day's wage was. At that denarius, time, children it would denarius. 300 odd days mm -hmm. to have earned enough to buy that. So when the Bible says it was considered to be like a year's wage, it really was um, something about that because it would have been about 300 odd denarii or more to purchase that thing. So it was extremely valuable. And the last thing I was saying is that because of the intensity of the, the aroma, it it would have been on his body for several, several days, you know, going on. Be honest. Yes. That's what I found. Amen. Amen. So you learn a little bit more. There's only one thing that I'm not clear on. In some translations in the book of Songs of Solomon, they translate it as myrrh. No, I'm not sure if Nard and myrrh were the same thing. Um you know, it might be, if, if you can do a little more research, even while we're doing this message, and then lighten us, it might be a good thing. Because it, sometimes translators will translate a certain way, but maybe it's not the same thing, but it could be. I'm not sure. So, you know, and the good thing they said it was pure, pure nod. So it was really undiluted, unblended. It was just a straight product. Wonderful. 
Well, I hope we've all poured out our alabaster jar of, of nard on the Lord Jesus. That means we've given him everything. I do hope we have. Now, the reason I've turned back to this, um, you know, I, I remember was playing the video last week and the reason why I, I, I turned back, I'm trying to be as thorough as I can, but the thing about the word of God for me, it's like a mirror. And so when you're standing, I don't know if anybody has ever done this. And in fact, I'm going to ask you, if there's anybody who's ever done, it, done this, let me know. Have you ever held a mirror in front of another mirror? And anybody, anybody out there, you have done it? You have held a mirror and you, what happened when you held a mirror? Is there anybody at all? You have held a mirror, what to play in front of another mirror? Anybody? Um, Am I the only person who has done it? Go ahead. Good morning. Who is mirror that? Appear inside of the mirror. Who is that speaking? Dominic. Oh, yes, Dominic. You have held a mirror in front of a mirror. And what did you see? Lots of More mirrors going way back, right? Yes, miss. Yes. And to me, that's how the word of God is. It's like mirrors and mirrors. You come to no end in terms of the dimension of the word of God. And so you read a scripture, but you read the scripture last week. But sometimes I really wonder, did you see it? Did you see that this was the coming of the king? I, I saw, as I, I continued to research it this week and, you know, trying to understand what was really taking place here. I don't know if there's a quick thing I can send to Mr. Rowe before we move on. Just enlightening you further on what was taking place. When um when he went on the donkey. Right, I'm not seeing that thing now, but it just what it meant. Well, I guess what I'll let I'll let you know next week because I'll have the videos ready and be able to. Or did I send it to you, Mr. Roo? I sent it to yes, you two. Yes, send me two. What, what's the Christmas. ones I sent you? Let me see what I sent you. One is called the triumphant entry of Jesus in Jerusalem. That we had showed last week. And the Not other one matters is... that week and this one. You know, I'm going to ask to show both again. Just to, the first one I think we showed last week. Show the first one first. The one, in, not this one, the next one. And just so we refresh our memory as we continue. And then show the next one. Thank you. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They found a colt outside in the street. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Praise God. Let us see the second video, though, please.
Loan from Jerusalem. I'm Jonathan Lipnick from eTeacher Biblical, and I'm standing on the summit of the Mount of Olives with the old city of Jerusalem directly behind me. I'm standing in the location where Jesus' journey into the city of Jerusalem begins on Palm Sunday. Chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke tells us that as people were waving palm fronds and singing Hosanna, Jesus approaches the city on the path leading down from the Mount of Olives, exactly the scenery that you can see behind me. Let's take a closer look. Jesus' final week in Jerusalem begins on Palm Sunday with a festive procession from the top of the Mount of Olives down into the Kidron Valley and in through the city's eastern gate. He is welcomed into Jerusalem like a triumphant king and people are waving palm branches and singing Hosanna or Hoshia Na, which literally means please save in Hebrew. But oddly, he is riding on a donkey, not what you would expect of a royal procession. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that Jesus sends two disciples to procure a donkey and a colt, and this is done in order to fulfill the messianic prophecy found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion! Shout, daughter Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. In this translation, the English word used is humble, which is probably influenced by the Greek praus, meaning unassuming, considerate, or meek. But in the original Hebrew text of Zechariah, the word used is ani. This literally means poor or afflicted. Poverty is a central theme of Jesus' ministry, as he encourages his disciples to get rid of all their possessions and famously says, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so it makes sense that poverty is also a major theme during Jesus' final week in Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, he begins his procession into the city from the house of Mary and Martha, which is located in a village on the backside of the Mount of Olives called Bethany, or in Hebrew, Beit Anya. This, in fact, is composed of two Hebrew words, Beit, house, and Ani, which means poor. So during the entire week that Jesus spends in Jerusalem, he's living in the run-down suburbs of Jerusalem, the house of the poor. It's Passover week, the peak season, and he cannot afford upscale accommodations inside the city where the wealthy pilgrims are staying. So this humble procession is meant to depict Jesus as a kind of anti-king. The Messiah should not enter Jerusalem like an earthly king who enters the city with full pomp and circumstance, riding on a white horse. Jesus has come to Jerusalem to die for the sins of humanity, and so he enters upon a humble or poor donkey. This humble first coming of Christ contrasts with the Apostle John's vision of the second coming, in which Jesus will return riding upon a white horse, as depicted in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. This is a sample of how reading the Bible in the original Hebrew and Greek has the power to transform your understanding of the scriptures. Okay, Mr. Otsan. Please click here to learn more Amen. about each year's Amen. I, I think we've made our point. And there's a lot I want to draw out here before I continue. One is, while I'm studying the thing, I'm still doing what the author said, trying to bring you to understand that there's a lot more to the scripture than a straight reading it just down like that and not taking time to peruse it. So there's a lot of meaning to the donkey. He is being here as king. One of the things, if you read the same account in in Luke, it gives a little more volume to this account. And you'll know people are saying that they were hailing him as king, yet he was on a humble little donkey. He was in a chariot. He was on a great white horse or a great horse. He was on a donkey. And while I'm teaching the scriptures, I'm trying to set them straight in people's head by getting a broader vision and comparing scripture and bringing in some of the Greek and Hebrew words used, etc. But I'm also trying to get people to be blessed spiritually. 
And what I want to draw out of the scripture today before we move on is the humility of Jesus Christ. He was humble. You know, for the last few weeks, there has been a story in the Christian world of Ravi Zakarian. Ravi Zakarian was a very, very famous, what they call an apologist. An apologist is somebody who knows the scripture extremely well, teaches the scripture extremely well, and is able to refute all the arguments that will come against the Christian faith. And he was one of the foremost apologists of our time. He really could speak and he, he knew how to, how to put the words. I mean, this man was so skilled. He met with extremely prominent people and they could not refute him. He was so skilled. And then he died. Personally, I was not such a listener of Ravi Zakarian. Not that I had anything against him, but I didn't listen to him a lot, right? He fell, he, sorry, he died. And right after he died, a lot of stuff came out of how wickedly this man had been living. This great man who is all over the internet, drawing thousands of thousands of followers, having his videos viewed by thousands, being invited across the globe. He was flying from one country to another, one university to another. Even unsafe people were invited him. It came out that he was a horrid sexual abuser, that his entire life, um, let me not say his entire life, but a significant portion of his life had been spent abusing women sexually. Right? Not one, not two, but many. He had them from country to country. He had massage parlors that he partially owned that he was heavily involved in sexual experiences with persons who he hired. Right? And it was one or two incidences. It was multiple, it was a lifestyle. So he died and then all this came out. How does that link to Jesus riding into Jerusalem? I believe we have reached a stage of our lives where we have postured the Christian minister as some great elevated person. While Jesus, our savior, was extremely humble. Over the last few years, I've watched many of the great men of God falling into a state of what you call ignominy, a state of disgrace. They're falling from great heights, down low. Our savior was down low. He kept himself humble. Even in his triumphant march into Jerusalem, he kept himself on a simple, humble donkey. Now you have to understand, Jesus has had a fantastic ministry. He had performed many miracles that nobody in his dear age had seen. He, he had raised the last great one that really spurred and triggered a lot of things was in, when he raised Lazarus from the dead. So here it is now. He's famous. The people are following him. Following him. Even the Pharisees are saying, look here, man, we have achieved anything. Everybody is following this man. So his ministry was great. It was at his peak. Here is the moment in which many of our earthly ministers would have seized, seized, seized sorry, the opportunity to come in pomp, pomp and grandeur. Here is a moment where in our modern age, they have said, you know what? In order to spread the gospel more, I need a jet. I need to be able to move from country to country because my ministry has grown so much that I need no need to spread it to other nations. I, I need to this and I and here's a moment when people are willing to give their substance into your ministry because they see value in your ministry. He's at that stage. He's at that stage. But he does something so odd. It's a furthering the greatness of the ministry that he had worked three years to build, he comes riding on a simple 
donkey. Not even one that he owns, but one that he supernaturally, through word of knowledge, knew was tied X or Y place, sent them for it, told them what to tell the owners, and he now rides on this humble donkey. That's how he chose to live. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to encourage us to go back to a place of meekness and humility in the ministry of God. Not only did Ravi Zakarian fall, but a significant number of men of God have fallen in this particular season. They have come from places of great heights and they've fallen right down. We don't need it. We need to stay on humble ground. You know, if you're, if you're standing on humble ground, you'll have nowhere to fall. Nowhere to fall. So much pain and disgrace you now lines the, the path where the family and the people are left behind of these many men who are falling. You just have to go in, in this information age. You just have to go on YouTube. You'll find a long list. I'm not one of those who believe we should be riding on their, their backs and on the disgrace and the sin of their lives. I don't. I believe we must, you know, well, in the case of Ravi, he's gone already, but those who are alive, we can pray. Pray for them and love them. But it's an opportunity to call the church of God back into humility. Even here in the nation of Jamaica, we have a lot of people are posturing themselves in greatness. They are too great. Right? Now remember, you know, I personally don't believe God is, is, um, is shaking in his boots because of the fall of these so-called great men. I believe, in fact, God is totally unperturbed because his kingdom will go forth because he had already prescribed how we are to do it. And Jesus, in his ride, his triumphal ride into the city of Jerusalem. Remember, my brethren, Jerusalem belongs to Jesus. He's coming back to the same Mount of Olives you heard mentioned. You heard a mention of Mount of Olives? He, he was at, at the backside. There was a town of Bethany with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, which was his go-to home when he was in that region. So you, you, you are hearing about that. The same Mount of Olives, the Bible says, he's going to put his foot on it. Jerusalem belongs to God. It is his city. Nobody on the earth can own the Jerusalem except those that the Almighty God has prescribed should own it. And he's marching into his own city, riding on a humble donkey. That's a, that's a message of humility. Before I, I go on, I want to leave with you. But before we go on to, I want to also introduce a particular topic. And that is the accuracy of the word of God. Because way back in Zechariah, and here's where Mr. Roy, you're going to have to do like a quick search for me. There's a prophecy of this particular march that he shall be riding in the donkey. And I did not, unfortunately, remember to write down my, my reference, but this is the book of Zechariah. He's marching into Jerusalem on a donkey. It was prophesied. Can you find that scripture for me, please? Have you found it? If you haven't, I'll try and find it. Could we do something? Um, I know it's kind of confusing to read together, but let us read the scripture together. It's a fantastic prophet, prophecy of the Bible written in the Old Testament under the prophet Zechariah. Let us, let us read it. I don't know if you can unmute your mic. I don't know if this will work. But let's, let's read it together. After three. One, two, three. Rejoice greatly, daughter, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to read the low now. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on the cord, the foal of a donkey. That was prophesied, you know, so, so the Bible is so deep that, that I, I, when I'm studying it, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the details, but this was prophesied, I'm trying to remember the year when Zechariah prophesied, but definitely it was way back, way back, probably 500 something BC because it was after the exile had come, exiles had come back from Babylon, from, from the Persian Empire. So I know it's way back there. A man prophesied it's going to be like this. Now I'm going to trigger, for some of you who are great students of the word and you want to be triggered to study further, you can go and look at Daniel chapter 9. I'm not going to go there right now. I hope to go there sometime, but not this minute. There's a very intricate set of scriptures. But believe me, there are timelines given there that could involve this particular significant march into Jerusalem. Here's the king, King Jesus. Amen. Let's move on in the scripture in John chapter 12. All right. We're going to verse 20. All right. So now he predicts his own death. And if you've been following me in these studies, you realize it's not the first time he's predicted his own death. In fact, there's a timeline of the last week of Jesus' life. We're not in the last week of Jesus' life, you know. And by the way, the book of John dedicates roughly 50% of the chapters of the book to the last few days of the life of Jesus. Believe it or not. So we're at 12, and this is his last week. That means all, roughly all the rest of the book of John will be dedicated to tell you what took place in this last period of the life of Jesus. Remember, he lived roughly 30 years before he started his ministry, and his ministry lasted roughly three years. So we're in approximately the 33rd year of Jesus on earth. That means he's younger than many of us listening. Right? And some of us are soon approaching that, that period of time. So here he is now, and the Bible is going to go from here to give us a really detailed account of what he does and says in that last period. By the way, the other Gospels also give significant periods of time to these last days. Some give one third, some give a quarter, but in every single Gospel, they have given significant verses and ch chapters to the accounts, the account of what took place in the last period of the life of Jesus Christ. And one of the things I'd love to present here, and I tried last time, but I have to do a lot more research to satisfy myself, is a timeline, what we call a timeline of the last few days of Jesus' life. Because there's always a controversy of saying which, on which day did he, was he crucified? We're not going to go there now. At some point, I'd love to explain to you. And it's very important that I explain to you so you understand, but not at this moment. Let's read down and see what's here. Now it says in verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. And this is the week of the Passover, by the way. That's a festival being referred to. And I want you, here's your homework. I'm going to give it out right now. You're going to find out to me, for me, there, are, there were some Greeks among those who went up. Somebody is going to discuss these Greeks for the next week. So you're going to take that cue. Please write it down, Mr. Kirkland. 
And somebody next week will explain to me who are these Greeks. So it says there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Beth Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we'd like to see Jesus. Philip went, to, Philip went to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. You know, I, I've always wondered when I'm reading these scriptures on my own, I am really listening to it keenly and wondering what's really happening here. Why did he go straight to Jesus? I mean, why did he find it necessary to talk to Andrew first? You know, so you know, these are little details that sometimes I ask myself questions about. Um, but let's continue. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This is one of my absolutely famous scriptures. Favorite scriptures, sorry. I really love this scripture. And it's a scripture I want you to make a note of today. Now, here's another question for you and for myself. When the Greeks came and said, we want to meet Jesus, the impression I get is that, okay, Philip goes to Andrew, and Andrew goes to Jesus, and here's Jesus' reply. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, so... It's a weird reply. I mean, why didn't you say, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to meet you right now? Or, yes, you may come. Why did he react like this? So I'm going to add that to your homework and to my homework. I have my own thoughts, but I'm not going to share them here. I'm going to ask you to investigate that as well. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So, as I said, it's one of my favorite scriptures. It's one of my memory scriptures. And it's easy to understand because it's so real. If you take a single grain of corn and you plant that grain of corn, what to, takes place is that that single grain has to, has to in a sense, disintegrate in its own selfhood, if, if one can call it that. If you dig it out before it, it actually starts to put up the sprout, you'll see it looks really messy and mashed up, like it, it's destroyed. That's what it refers to in this verse, as it has to die. It has to lose, lose its own self-identity. It has to lose what it is about before it can begin to bring forth this new life. But if you keep watching that grain of corn, you will notice, yes, when it starts to look, first it will suck in some water, look bloated, and then look mashed up and skin peeling off. And, and then something will happen after this, this gusting phase that it begins to put off a sprout. That's the new life. And that new life is going to grow up into a full corn stalk. And that corn stalk may have, maybe say, let's say it bears six cords on it, six ears of corn, right? Now, if each of these have, I'm just looking at a corn, corn um, ear of corn in my mind, and I'm saying if 150, I guess you could say maybe it could have 50 times 6, 300 grains on each of these ears of corn, and if it's six, that's 1,800, let me hope my maths is correct. So it's it's 300 per ear, say, I'm just saying. And it's six ears, that's 1,800 grains of corn. Now this one corn grain, because in a sense it was willing to die, is turning out 1,800 corn grains. That's what I want to lead to. For, for you to understand this morning. You have your Google all around you. So if you can search out for me, I don't know if you'll find that very easily, but probably you will. What is expected? What's the yield expected from one single grain of corn? Let me see if I've overestimated or underestimated. 
right. So just search it out for me, even while I'm speaking. So this is what happens, right? And God is saying, that's what has happened to you and I. We have to be like that congregant. We have to die. We have to die to bring out this life. All these great corn grains that can come, ears of corn that can come from the one grain. But we have to give up ourselves. We have to surrender, right? We have to be willing to be planted, buried. That's why I said dies, because it's buried like a dead body under the earth, covered over before it can bring out all that productivity. What that, to me, that death simply means a complete surrender. We have to be willing to, to totally surrender. There's a song we used to sing in the, in the start of this ministry by Robin Marks. It's a, I sur everything. You give everything. You give both, the, you know, all for Jesus, I think it was called. And everything is given. Everything. We're going to give all, everything to him. Everything, and it's not just the things we have now, but we're also surrendering the future, the things we don't see, the things we have planned. We, like Jesus, we have to die. We have to be humble, right? And we have to die in order to produce. Did anybody find out what's a good approximation of one grain of corn, what it will yield? Anybody at all? Nobody. All right, you can add that to your homework. All right? It says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wind falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That's what I want you to be. That's what I want myself to be. Amen. Anyone who loves his life, now what Jesus is going to do, he's going to explain what that means. So he says, anyone who loves his life, because if you love your life, you're not going to want to die. But anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So it says, if you if you don't love, if you're not too attached to the world that you want to preserve yourself, then you will be willing to surrender everything of this earth in order to gain and to keep your life for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. So we're going to follow him on that donkey in the height of our moment when we, we are coming into our glory and when the opportunity exists to seize the moment for our aggrandizement and to come into our, our, our time, our season, our glory, to buy the jet. When that moment comes, when we can be on the front page of the newspaper. <laughs> I don't know if I should say this here, but... You know, I've never, I don't desire a lot of earthly honors. So these various honors they have all over the place, it just doesn't appeal to me, right? So we, we have to reach that stage when the moment presents itself and we choose the way of Christ instead. instead. So it continues. Whoever serves me must follow me and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. What a promise. Father, help us to serve you so you can honor us. I'd love to be honored of the father. What about you? And what he says, where I am, notice the tense. Where I am, my servant also will be. You could preach an entire message. Because you see, if you're really examining the scripture, that tense gives you a problem. Where I am, he says, okay, when he's speaking to the people who are there, where I am in a place of humility, riding a donkey at the last moment of my death. Yes, that's where he is when he's speaking to them. Where is he now when he's speaking to me and he's speaking to you? He's in heaven. He's the eternal intercessor. He is functioning in a heavenly realm. But our Bible says, I am seated with Christ at the right hand of God, far above every principality and power. That's another whole message. How can I be here on earth sitting here in a chair, but also be with Christ Jesus in heaven at the same time? That's another message. I don't want to start it here. 
But when you enter into God and you enter into his kingdom, you enter into the realm of the supernatural. And we, be, we become actually beings that function in the way in which the Bible stipulates, not in a mere human form, in how everyday life goes for the average unsafe. We are to be lifted out of that and lifted into the word of God and everything that he has said we would have. And then my father will honor the one who serves me. Well, that promise I want for myself right now, Lord, I want you to honor me. Granted, brethren, the honor that the father gives might not be in your timeline, not in the form that we might imagine, but his honor is the best honor you could have. Verse 27, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason. I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Brethren, I can identify with this woman in Christ's life. I don't know if you've ever faced something which you know is going to be very difficult. It's going to be a very hard period. And you, 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 you know you have to go through it. You know you have to bear the fear, the, the, the pain. It could be a med medical procedure, for example. But you, honestly, you don't want to really experience it. Uh, you know, recently I saw two humorous clips about men who are getting injections. It was very humorous because these big, strong men were crying and they were cringing and they were trying to move away from the needle and eventually they had to be held to get the little injection they needed, right? It was very humorous because they're normally strong. And I understood what was happening to them. Yes, they knew they had to get this injection, but oh my goodness, they feared that needle. And every time he looked at it, he started to cry. But on a more serious note, especially for people who have had children, like myself, you, you reach a stage where that baby is going to be delivered. But you know what pain is going to be. Like for me, after the first one, I knew it was painful, but it is a horrid experience. So you know the baby has to be born, and you know you want to go through it, and you know that it will be a great experience to see that baby born, but you dread the pain. And I understand what Jesus is going through, right? He said, my soul is troubled. His soul is troubled. His mind is troubled. His thoughts are troubled. But what shall I say? He said, what can I do? I, I can, do I call to the Father? Do I say, Father, don't run away. Do me a beg you. Take me out of this. Rescue me, God. I don't want to do it. He said, no, no, I can't do that. Because this is the reason why I came on earth in the first place. This is why I was born. I was born for this hour. I was born to die for the sins of humanity. That's why I came. So if I beg the Father now to take this cup from me, I would have defeated the, the reason I came. There's no other reason why I came. No, Father, glorify your name. I think that's what we all need. We need the Father to glorify his name in us. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowds that were there heard it said, heard it said, the crowds that were there heard it said and said that it thundered. Others said, an angel had spoken to him. So they heard a voice from heaven, but they, 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 they wondered, what was this? You know, it's not the first time the father has spoken from heaven concerning his son on earth. Not the first time. And not only in this case either, there have been, many, there have been other occasions when the father has spoken from heaven, like in the case of Paul. Saul, Saul then, who was later, later named Paul, changed his name to Paul, but a voice came from heaven as well, right? So he spoke from heaven and he said, right, but they thought it had thundered. Somebody said an angel had spoke. They were confused. 30, Jesus said, this voice was for you, your benefit, not mine. Now is the time come for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up, from the earth will draw all people to myself. 
He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So he was saying, listen, this is the moment now. This is this moment of my death is going to is going to glorify the Father and it will destroy the works of the evil one. Because I am going to die, yes, but I'm going to be resurrected. And in so doing, I'm going to get victory over death and the grave and over Satan. This will be a mighty moment of victory for the Father, for the Godhead, for God. And he, he said, when I'm lifted up, when they think they have defeated me, that's when I'll draw all men unto me. And that's speaking of his crucifixion. And there was a prophecy way back in the Old Testament where they were beaten by the people, the Israelites, as they traveled out of Egypt. They were beaten by a snake and the snake venom was, was there. There were lots of, lots of snake in fact. And God told Moses, put a pole, I put a snake at the top. Every time they look on that pole, they are going to be healed and delivered. This was a prophecy in this very moment. Pardon? Hello? Someone turn on their Oh, mind. I'm sorry. Turn it on. Right. Okay. If you can find that scripture for me, Mr. Roy, you can bring it up. We'll soon be at the end now. So this, he said, when you look on it, this is a prophecy that lines up with what Jesus just said. When I am lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto me. That prophesied Jesus. That snake on that stick was actually Jesus. Can you believe it? It showed him taking our sin on himself. Right? And when we look to him, believe upon him, we'll be delivered. All right. He said, then the Lord said, venomous snake. But by the way, it's, it's what? It's what chapter and verse? Numbers 21. All right. You can go down now. Let, let's start. Let's start at, um, right. Let's start at, at verse 5 or so. Go up a little bit. All right, 4, yes. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. And by this miserable food, they're talking about manna, the supernatural food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, they looked at the bronze snake and they lived. And that was a type of Christ. Because what Christ actually did, he bore all our sins. He died for us. If you can imagine a scenario, you can go back to the, the um, scripture in John. If you can imagine a scenario where you are indicted in a very serious matter, Say you're indicted for murder. You have indicted for the murder of three people. And you're in court, the jury, everybody has met, and they've decided, you know, I want to make it real to you. So, um, make, so you can identify with it. Let's, let's, let's say then, one day you were driving your vehicle, and it so happened that you were very tired, and you knew you were very tired. You had not gotten any rest for a long time. And you're driving, so you fell asleep at the wheels. But not only that, your vehicle fitness was up. You, you ran into a bus stop and killed 12 people, including some children. Now, the law is not going to look at that very lightly. Number one, your fitness, fitness was up. What that means, the load of the vehicle is effective or not. But two, you're telling them you were tired at the wheels. You have a responsibility to make sure when you're driving, you're fit to drive. So you go to court and you're, you're, you're convicted of manslaughter in the case of 
12 individuals, including children, men and women. And the court decides you are going to be uh, in prison for 40 years, let's say. And you're thinking this end of the world for me and my wife, my children, or my husband and my children. What am I going to do? 40 years in, in prison. You're sorry, but the fact is you're guilty. And then somebody steps in, somebody with the authority, and they said, I am going to serve the sentence of this person. I am going to serve the sentence of this person. That's what Jesus did for you. So when he was lifted on the cross, he took all of your sin and my sin and the sin of all human beings, past and present, on himself. But you know, this is something about the story. They have to look at the serpent to be healed. So if people do not choose to look to Christ, then they cannot benefit from him bearing their sin and their guilt. So he said, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw men unto myself. Now listen, brethren. I actually read a story recently where a judge convicted someone, can't remember what it was he was convicted of. And it was a, not a major offense, but still the person was sentenced. I think it was, was it a repeated drunk driving? A repeat, something like that. And the, the person was, was, was sentenced a camera was one or more nights in jail or in prison. And you know what the judge decided to do? He decided to serve it with the person. True, true story. Listen to me. I think why he decided that, because the person was coming before him again and again. The person kept falling into the same offense, whatever it was, again and again and again and again. And the judge decided, does this person know the gravity of sin? Do they know what this offense is doing to them? I am going to serve that sentence. And so he went into prison with the guy in the jail cell. This is real. This is real. I read it recently. I saw the video. No. Jesus did it for you. He did it for you. And this is what the story is about. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So we're back to the confusion, we're back to the fact you have seen it when we go through the Gospels that the people couldn't grab it. And even some of his disciples and apostles, apostles took a while before they understood what Jesus was saying. So he was speaking spiritual mysteries. Spiritual mysteries. And they would not be grabbing it quite what does he mean so the crowd the crowd is speaking there he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die so when he said i've been lifted up i'll draw men unto me so the crowd spoke and they were not asking questions they were puzzled let's go down to 35. then jesus told him you are going to have the light just a little while longer walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you Whoever walks in the dark does not know where he's going. Believe in the light, that is Jesus. While you have the light, so you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Now he hid himself because he had a timeline. He had a timing. And so he's trying to fulfill that timing. And so he knew this was not a moment. He had a few more days. Certain things had to happen before, so he hid himself from them. We'll continue next week. Remember your homework. And may God richly bless you.